because that's not how life should be. Life should be enjoyable, and God put everybody here in this world for a reason, to be happy for the time you have. And we are all family. God made Adam and Eve. He didn't make a black Adam and Eve, or white. he made Adam and Eve. We're all descendants from him. So, and he doesn't make junk, so we're all good. <laughs> <laughs> Who would have thought six months ago that we would be having a congregational session on race relations during a pandemic? Who could have foreseen this? Anybody here? Because if you have, then I think you must have that crystal ball that I keep looking for here. I still can't find it. Um, we are here today because the events of this past summer have caused us all to think and reflect, not only here but across our nation. And I've shared with you that I lived for a while and I have a lot of roots, family, friends, and so forth in the South Minneapolis neighborhood where George Floyd was killed and where the looting and rioting happened afterwards, which kind of triggered all of this discussion and protests across the country and even across the world. Our bishops, Elizabeth Eaton for the ELCA and then Susan Candia for the Central State Synod, have encouraged us to have courageous conversations to, um, instead of stuff it inside, which is what a, co a common response that we have, is to speak and to talk about these matters. And so we uh, are also aiming to follow their goals of de-escalating some of the tensions with these conversations. And so um, what I want to say is, is that I don't anticipate that we are going to solve all the problems of racial relations or justice this morning. And I'm not proposing anything big or long-term because, as you know, I'm not long-term. And I'm not going to start something that I can't see through or follow through. However, when we thought about the bishop's instructions or, or guidance to us to have these conversations, um, the executive committee thought, is there something that we can do right here, right now, amongst ourselves? And I remembered a conversation that I had with Howard and Sonia last winter. Um, Sonia, uh, excuse me, Howard had a knee replacement, and so I paid a pastoral visit to his home. And um, they shared very freely what it was like to uh, grow up as black people in the small towns and in the uh, urban areas of this region. And also, a lot of thoughts about race relations and the situation now. And so, my thought went to them because... They were the first and maybe the only ones that, in my time here at Living Lord, have brought this up in any kind of a systemic basis. So I called them, and we talked a little bit about it, and out of that emerged the idea that we would have this session on race relations. And I'm going to be starting with Sonia in just a minute to share uh, her experience with that title and term, Race Relations, as she tells some of the stories from her childhood and experience. And then I really wanted to have someone else to help with this conversation. And I remember that um, Bethany was uh, asked to interview me for an online congregational session in early May. And I was thinking, what in the world would you interview me about? I just couldn't imagine. And she has such a warm and engaging quality that she's an excellent interviewer. And pretty soon, I was saying all kinds of things that I had no intention of saying. So I'm kind of hoping that that might happen to the Harris's as well. But um, anyway, so it was out of my experience. This does not mean that the people that are up here are the only ones that have something to say about this topic. It's just that in my limited experience here, they are the ones that came forward and began the conversation, which is all we're trying to do. You've heard me say that my favorite saying is that the journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. And that's, I think, what we need to think about today, as a single step creating a safe place in the church. If we can't talk about these things in the church, 
where can we talk about them? And so let's just have a respectful listening conversation this morning. We will anticipate that we'll hear from Howard and Sonia for about 35 minutes. And at that point, we will um, uh, take some questions. And the matter of questions when we're wearing masks is going to be a little complicated, but I think what I'll do is if you have a question, I will go and stand near you so that if you can't be heard through the mass, then I can just repeat the question so that uh, hopefully everyone will be able to hear your questions. So without further ado then, I'm going to ask Sonia if she could share some of your experiences growing up in the area and also something about this title, Race Relations, and how we came up with that for this session. Yes, yes I can. Um, I grew up, was born in Washington, Missouri, so uh, Grew up in Robertsville, Missouri, St. Clair, <clears throat> the Union of St. Clair area. Um, and pertaining to the race relations, Southern Baptists, I grew up Baptist, a lot of ministers in the family, but we would have race relations every year. A minister from a white church would come to our church, our minister would go to their church, our choir would go to their church, their choir, and every year we shared this. Um, which was a great ideal. You know, we always had wonderful turnout. Everybody was very gracious and respectful and just had a good time serving the Lord. Um, and growing up, I can tell you there's been many instances, but probably when I was around eight, seven, eight, uh, my grandparents lived in Union, Missouri, and so we would be at their home in the my cousin and I would go to the 5 and 10 uh, <clears throat> store to buy candy. We would go into the store, and as soon as we went into the store, someone is right there. We'd go down the aisle looking for candy, and they're standing at the end of the aisle like this. We'd look at them, because they did it all the time, so we just laughed about it. We'd run over to another aisle, and they'd go over to the other aisle and stand, stare at us like this. It's like, we just came to buy candy, you know? <laughs> Um, and so, you know, I, I say that to say this, um, Nelson Mandela said, a child is not born knowing hate. He's taught hate. And if you can be taught to hate, you can be taught to love. So we need to teach that with our kids, you know. Um, there's a commercial on TV there's two little boys running down the sidewalk. One is white and one is black. They see each other, they run and they hug. They don't know hate, you know? They look like they're about two or three years old, you know? So we have to learn to teach love. That's what God um, wants us to do. God is love. So we need to love one another. No matter what color of your skin, we're all the same. God created all of us. Howard, let's hear some of your story and history. And uh, good morning. Good morning. Um, when we talk about late race relation, and it's a very uncomfortable, very uncomfortable subject. So if you're feeling uncomfortable, you're in the right place. Because when you talk about racism, no one wants to talk about it because no one wants to say, "Hey, they are part of it, or they're not a part of it," which we all are part of it. So no matter where you live at. No matter what your salary, what your position may be in life, we're all a part of the system for racism. I was raised in East St. Louis, Illinois. At the age of 12, my father sent me from East St. Louis down to visit his, my grandmother in Columbia, Mississippi. I took a Greyhound bus out of East St. Louis down to Little Rock, Arkansas. And as a little story, I had a 12-year-old. I sat in front of the bus next to the driver so I could see the highway and have the biggest perspective of what was coming down the road. When I got down, there was no problem going to Arkansas. When I got to Arkansas, we changed buses, and the bus driver, well, that bus was apparently putting the uh, luggage under the, under the bus, and when he came back up, I had taken that same seat on this bus going down to, to Columbia, Mississippi. This guy was big and burly, came and got in my face, and he said to me, nigga, if you don't get your black ass to the bus, I'll throw you off this bus. That was when I realized things were different in my life. So 
as I began to go back home and everything, I realized I had been sheltered in a, in a part of the world for, for which I had not known racism. I went through high school. I graduated from high school. I didn't go to the Army. I went to the Air Force. Because I felt I had what it took to go to the Air Force. I said, oh, you know, you, the Army was just drafting people. I wanted to go a cut above. Couldn't go to college, didn't have the money. So I thought I'd go to the Air Force. I went to the Air Force. And I realized that the experience I had as a 12-year-old was still following me. Because when I got in the Air Force, there were 60 people in a flight of newcomers to the Air Force. And the 60 people in that flight, three of them was now white. There were two blacks and one Mexican. And I really felt what racism was when I was in service. I had my first fight in the second week. And I wear my scarf proudly right now over here. <laughs> I, got, I got four stitches. <laughs> My opponent is carrying somewhere in this world 52 stitches. <laughs> because I came from East Hamlet, I learned how to fight. <laughs> and I took a folding chair and I retaliated. But the next day when the TI came around, he never said a word to us. He said, whatever happened, I don't want to know about it. Go over to the medical and get stitched up, and I'll see you in a few minutes on, on the PT pad. This is how life was for myself. As I grew up and I came out of the service, I got out of the service because I realized I was, I was not the fit for the service. Because no matter how you try, to me, I learned life was, was suppressing. You were suppressed. No matter how good you were, it was never good enough. People looked at you for the color of your skin. The color of my skin, the color of your skin, the only difference is I have more pigmentation. You don't know me as a person. You don't know me by the color of my skin. How can you judge my character? But that's been done all my entire life, and it's still going on today. Mm -hmm. So when, I, when I, I, finished, I finished the Air Force, I came out of the Air Force, I got a job at Chrysler. I was very fortunate. I was one of the first. I was the first black sergeant out there in security. I was the second black superintendent in Heidi Chrysler. I did a pretty fantastic job. And no matter when you think you're still doing good, there's something always coming out and let you know you didn't do it. you're not doing as good as you think you are. After I had been an executive for 10 years, the guy who promoted me came to me and he said to me very sternly. And I appreciate his honesty. He said, Howard, you have done a fantastic job. He said, but I'm going to tell you something. When I hired you, I didn't think it was worth a damn. I didn't think he was going to make it. I thought he was going to fail. He never knew me until I had to prove myself. And it's, 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 it's a given. Each day, you have to prove yourself. And I don't mind taking it myself, but I take it first when it comes to my family. My son, Blake, is my youngest child. I seen him through the entire Lutheran school system. I seen him I, I, at first, before, and before he went to school, he was subject to that as well as myself. I don't know if anybody knows uh, the, uh, the daycare centers in St. Charles. Uh, I went to pick my son up one day. Now, he has biracial. He's very light-skinned. And I'm called that you see me now. Anyhow, I'm picking him up. It was nap time. And he had been sleeping. And, when, and I, I picked him a little early. Cause, and he had, he had given him a cookie. And I was bringing him out of, out of the, out of the uh, daycare center. And he began to cry because the cookie broke. I said, Blake, I'll give you another cookie when we get home. We gotta get home, but we got got had an appointment to be taken to. Anyhow, at this time, two white officers from the city of uh, St. Charles happened to be passing by, and they saw him crying. And they came over, they parked their car, put their red light on. Now, most of you don't may not understand, but I'll tell you, it was my desire to become a police officer when I came out of the Air Force, because I spent four years in the Air Force protecting this country because I felt I'm protecting America, you know, not the Black America. I'm protecting America. But when I came out, I realized that I'm still fighting for my rights, as I was before I went in there. Anyhow, so the police car comes up, and he says, what's going on, sir? I said, nothing. My son's just crying because his cookie broke. He said, is that your son? I said, yes, it is. He said, we're going to have to take you back inside and have them verify this. I said, really? He said, yes. So I had to take him back inside and have the uh, people in daycare center say, yes, that's Mr. Harris' son. That's Blake. That's his son. So these are things you go through on a daily basis, so. We get from uh, there and we get into to high school. He went to high school over here uh, on Mexico Road. The Lutheran High School? The Lutheran High School. He was very astute, very smart child, very good in sports. Uh, in, in, his, in his 10th year, he was in his 10th grade, sophomore year, he came back to his locker one day and there was a news on the wall that said, nigga, go home. Now, I can take that. But for my son to put up with that, I think it's the wrong thing in the wrong place. 
they had a difficult time trying to contain me after it happened to him, you know, because I didn't appreciate it at all. But it's like anything else in this world we live in today, somehow you got to find the resolution with that within yourself to try to deal with it, you know. There was no one exposed, expelled from school. We, they talked about it. They prayed about it. And I guess it's still going on because I don't think anything was done about it. This same son of mine, he played football for the, for the football team. He would run the fall, football 80 yards down to five yards where they scored a touchdown. And they would give it to a white boy to score a touchdown. I talked to the coach about this. The coach said, uh, you're right, Mr. Harris. We've got to do a better job now. I said, if you don't, he's not playing sports for you. So he was subjected to this in high school, in Lutheran High School. My same son, Blake, had a GPA average and with his test score, he earned a four-year scholarship at that time, Northeast Missouri State. See, when they knew this kid as being a black kid, they didn't know his potential. All they knew was the fact the color of his skin. And for that, he paid a, he paid a heavy price. He and I talked about this about two weeks ago on the telephone. He lives in Ohio right now. But things like this happen every day. I live in St. Charles here. I have seen more prejudice in St. Charles than I thought I'd see in a place else. Um, I like Hardy's Biscuits down here on the end of the road in St. Louis Boulevard here. So one morning I thought I'd go up and get me about four biscuits down there. And, you know, I drove down the, to, the, uh, to Hardy's. And driving down, I, apparently I was in a hurry to get there too fast, so I exceeded the speed limit. So a police officer stopped me. He said, sir, you're speeding. I said, okay, I'm, I wasn't intent. I was just trying to get over here to Hardy's. He says, uh, you exceeded the speed limit by 10 miles an hour. I didn't think I was doing that fast, so. He says, and you're in a double fine zone. A double fine zone, I said, okay. I didn't see the sign that said that. So after we had the conversation, he gave me a ticket. I went back and I looked at the signs, the signage on the entire road. I went from one side of that end of uh, Lake San Luis Boulevard to the end of it. Four or five times. I never saw a sign that said double fine zone. So I went to the police department and I, and I told him about this. He said, uh, he said uh, well, sir, you had to take that up with the court. So I said, fine. So I, what I did was I engaged myself a lawyer, and my lawyer said, Mr. Harris, I want you to go to court and tell them exactly what happened. So I went to court, and I, when I got to the court over there, I noticed the number of people in court there was overwhelming. There were about like 60 people in a small courtroom, of which uh, I counted 48 was black. So I said, okay, fine. You know, my time came. I had to work by myself at that time. So I go up to the, uh, to the judge and told him what happened. He said, I had on a Michigan shirt, a Michigan state shirt. He said, did you go to Michigan? I said, no, I didn't. I, I graduated from Omsal down here. He said, man, he said, that's my, that's my, that's my alma mater. I said, wow. So he was talking about Michigan. I told him I worked at Chrysler in the place that I had gone in there. He said, what, what do you got here for? I said, they said that I was speeding a double, a double a fine zone and the fine is $200. He said, what? I said, yeah. He said, well, I'll tell you what. We're not going to hear that. You know where you're at. Don't worry about it. Just go over and pay the court $25. There will be no charge against you for penalty, for speed, and anything like that. So don't worry about it. So there is some people that, that see through what's going on in the world today. But it's still in existence every day we live here. I live in, I live, like I said, I live, in, I live in Lake St. Louis. I live in a, in, in a very... Uh, I consider it a nice upscale community. Uh, I've been there for 16 years, and my wife and I, we normally travel quite a bit. However, COVID-19 has somehow, somehow put, put the skiers on there for a minute. <laughs> so we spend more time around the house, and it does come more questions. People say, you live here? Uh, how long have you been living here? Most of them are just, most of them just got there in the last two or three years. We say like 16 years, and they go like, 16 years? I mean, I'm thinking, you know, this is red line. I am not being, uh, you know, uh, singled out uh, for whatever reason, you know. Uh, but anyhow, these things exist. Every day we put up these things. And racial relationship and, 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 and for all intents and purposes in America is live and well. People don't want to talk about them, you know, and they, they, they forget how, how America was built. I don't think anyone, in, in, in anyone you, you check, check their lineage back in your family, I don't think you're going to find any white slave in your family anywhere. This country built on blacks. It's the backs of black slaves. People don't want to admit that. Sure, a lot of things they don't want to admit. 
Why do we have a police department? The police department originally was built, you know what? I wanted to become a policeman. I really did. And I would have had Christ not offered me more money. But the police department was built back after slavery to protect whites. Check your books out. It tells you that. So a lot of them has gotten past that, but that's still added today as to what they do. You see this large city with all this, all this police department. Uh, you take uh, New York, where they got 45,000 policemen up there. That's a lot of policemen, right? And the population, most of them are put where? In the black areas to keep the blacks in those areas, and others are put out to protect the white areas. That's where we live in today. But I, I just want to share that with you, you know, because uh, we deal with it every day. I li like I say, I live in a nice area out there, and people, I don't, I take care of my property. I'm a good neighbor. If you need something, I'm there to help you. Uh, I'm not the type of guy who goes and asks you for a cup of sugar. I just be taking care of my property and live with my wife and enjoy myself while I stay at. I like to have a conversation with my neighbors whenever it's possible. Uh, I have a neighbor who lives right next to me. I know she cannot stand the sight of me being the person I am because of the color of my skin. She doesn't know anything about me. But just two weeks ago, my son came over and we were loading a, uh, loading a, uh, some of his bikes. Uh, on his truck, because he says he's no longer on the bike. And uh, the lady came on up porch and took a picture of us putting his bike on top of his car. And you say, I can't believe it. Sure you can. This is America. You saw what happened to Mr. George Floyd. You think, you think this racism is only alive and well in, in America? No, it's not. You saw all the other countries, all everybody protesting the fact that, hey, this is existence. So no one's exempt from racism or trying to have better relations in America, uh, in, in the world today. It's something we should all get involved in. Yes, it makes you very uncomfortable because you say, I'm not a racist. How do you know? If, you, if somebody comes, if you, if you have a daughter and she brings a black boy home, how do you feel about that? If a white move in your neighborhood, what do you think? The neighborhood's going to go bad? Or are you going to move further out? It's just the way we live today. But I think uh, racism myself is <coughs> oppressive. It suppresses a man of color. It makes him feel that he's never good enough no matter what challenge he may make. You set, the, you set the bar high, he gets to the bar, and guess what you do? You move it higher. Because this is what racism is all about in the world today. Racism is a white problem. The black man is a victim of the problem. I'm just telling you. So I want to share that with you. Thank you. <laughs> Howard said, I've been dealing with this for 75 years, so I'm not afraid of this conversation today. And I said, I would much rather do anything than have the conversation. But I have been studying um, because of Ella, um, Ella, Reverend Ella Molman, right? Um, she started the study of me and white supremacy. And uh, right after George Floyd was killed, I thought there's got to be something I can do, and so that came up, and I thought, okay, I'm going to study, because I don't know what's going on. Is this my, kind of what's going on? And then I was like, oh, I want to tell everybody, I'm going to study me and white supremacy. That doesn't look right, right? That's a right term. I'm not a Nazi. I'm not a KKK. How do I put my name with white supremacy? So then, as you go through the study, you understand that as a white person in America, I, ha I have never had to deal with the issues that my black friends have had to deal with. I don't go into a grocery store and expect someone to follow me or harass me. I don't cringe when the policeman comes by me. There was never a word to my brothers about policemen. If I went into a bookstore or the library, I could get a magazine or a book that had the picture of someone that looked like me, you know? If I needed hair products, I wasn't worried that they wouldn't be there. I, and the thing is, is that that's like a handful of stuff. So we absolutely have no idea what it's like to every day face that, every day. You never know who's gonna be the one is going to say something ignorant because of your skin pigmentation. <laughs> right. 
So the book has been very uh, enlightening and has made me mad because she's put statements, you know, how do you feel your racism, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, well, I, I'm not racist. I'm not racist, you know. And then she reminds me, you are in a white-centered society. Everything is for you. So what happens if you begin to look at it as, where's the room at the table, as you put so, so well, Pastor Lanny, at one of your ser sermons? Push over. What's it? What's it like if there's as much room for, for your, your black friends as there is for you? What if there's as much room for you? What's that look like? And so it's been a very challenging, uh, a challenging study. So I highly recommend it. It's painful, painful, but mm -hmm. I think it's time for us to have some of the pain because we absolutely don't understand what you have gone through. And thank you so much for gracing us with your, your stories and, and it's, it's, education it's a, for us today. And we were, it's a blessing that you asked us and we can tell our story, you know, because people don't know, people don't know. Well, you know, and, and, and let me just clean it up. You hear the story of black power and it, and it just, just goes if you just make them real mad. They just like, black power, what's that all about? Have you ever heard the statement, white power? If you haven't heard it, wouldn't it make you think, I wonder why I haven't heard it? Because it's understood that black lives matter, but white lives matter, and now we're going to say, guess what? Black life matters also. All life matters. Yeah, wow. we just don't have the two on it, but Black Lives Matter also. It's automatic white lives matter. You know, there's been, never been a question. So Black Lives, it has, it's put out there, we matter too. And, 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 and let's go to these, 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 these demonstrations. People's like, ah, oh, they, they tearing up everything. There they go again. I do not <coughs> condone going out there and destroying people's property. I think that's the worst thing you can do. These people worked hard for their property. They invested their money. They somehow got it together. They got it going. They're looking for a future and a retirement out of this business. They don't want you to destroy it. And so what happens is people say, okay, let's go out and, and, and tear this building down. Now, that's brick and mortar. Don't get me wrong. And 90% of the time or more, it's insured. It can be rebuilt. And if you notice, it's being rebuilt even better than it was before. That's not the idea. But some people, this, that's not a trade-off between a life. You can't get a life back no matter what. You can put that brick and mortar by someone. People go out and they, and they cause all this these trouble and scene and they destroy this stuff. They're trying to do what? They're trying to get your attention. They're just trying to get your attention to say, we got a problem. they like for you to understand what the problem really is. I don't think anyone goes out there. I don't think I've heard any black person say, give me some money. I don't think anyone asks for compensation for anything. I've never have and never will. I think the best thing you have in your life is when you go out and earn yourself and you know how it is and you feel better about yourself as a person because you earned it. And I think people say, hey, I don't want you to give me anything, just a chance to be who I am. Give and give me an opportunity. That's all they're asking for, nothing more. No one's asking you to, to share your loaf of bread with them. You know, to give me a nickel out of the dime you have. They're just saying, hey, give me an opportunity to be who I can so I can get it for myself and for my, for my family as you do for your family, nothing more. But the suppression comes. That's what I was speaking of earlier. But you want to talk about the incident with the park out here? And, and, and this is her favorite part, so I don't want to take it, you know. <laughs> okay, at the park, Bolivar Park here, we were there. This has been some years ago. We were just hanging out there, sitting out. You know, and they close at dusk. You know, you got to be out by nine. There was a lot of people there. So it's about a quarter till, and a policeman comes up and tells everybody to, you know, you got to clear out, disperse. Everybody's walking to their car. She tells us, bring me your license. Wait, 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 bring your license to me. I'm like, what's that all about? So we did. And then you can tell your part what you did next. 
because I am not the person you see here now. That's why I'll be Sam Lewis. So I went to the police station and was like, what's this all about? Are we being profiled for any reason or why? We was actually at the park. We left the park. And on leaving the park, she singled us out, and we have to give her identification. Why was it necessary for her to do that? And as always, the officer said, well, sir, she's new on the job, and she thought she was doing for was white. was right. Excuse me, I put the right in there for a reason why I put the white. <laughs> <laughs> but anyhow, seriously, it, it's, it's disturbing that you have to do this, to go through this, you know, and, and you know, I, I, I be very honest with you, I don't think that these discussions are good to have these forums, and they're just there to make you aware that these problems exist, as I said earlier. It's a problem for everybody. It's not just a, a black problem. It's an everybody problem. You have to get to it and resolve it. And you're not going to solve that problem now. We're not going to probably see that problem solved during our tenure in this world, because we live, here, we live in a world a very short time. I used to always use the adage, the fact that you see these big tall trees all around our houses, they'll be here for hundreds of years. We won't be here maybe if we make it 90 years, we've done well, you know? So this problem we're talking about, it has coexisted hundreds of years. Maybe start talking now, makes it happen. I think one thing that gave us a push on it was the COVID, uh, you know, say something bad, something didn't come out, something bad. Everybody had been pinned, in the house, pinned up in the house for all those months, and all of a sudden they see this black man, uh, being held down for eight minutes and 40 seconds, and he, he passed away, and they think, you know what, that's not right. Now, I don't know what they have been watching, how many movies they have been watching, how many times they're getting high in the house, but they all came out and said, this is wrong. And, they, and, and for the first time, you see the white power, they say, hey, you know, for the first time, they're taking leave and say, this is wrong. This is not right. I may have said silence before, but no more. It's not right. This is a human life you're taking here. And so I think maybe gathering speed from the white is going to be help to push this thing along, you know. And we hope so. I don't know that it's going to bring a resolution, like I say, in time. But it's good to do one thing. Everything started, like the pastor said, one step. So a conversation is the way to start it all, you know. And we do appreciate you guys for coming to listen to us today, you know. And, uh, you know, anything question you have, you know, I'd be happy to have you happy to entertain questions. But, uh. We just think you should be aware of what's going on in the world around you and know that, hey, everything is not hunky dory as you may think, you know. So you go to your life and you go home today, it just gives you something to think about. And as I said earlier, if you're uncomfortable, imagine how we feel. And one last thing before the questions, we have like 17 grandkids, right? Biracial, all different colors, right? We love all of them. One of them, when he was about five, he, asked, he said, I wish I was white. Because and it, it hurts. Howard, if you could finish, I mean. He had gone to school, and all the white kids had taunted him because he was not the same color. And, and having been through that type of scenario, because kids, uh, as Sonia said earlier, they are taught this. They, they don't come in here with these, with these, these prefix idea that uh, I'm better than you and you are nigger and, and I'm white. That's not, they, they're taught this. They're taught this. They didn't come in here from birth to know this, you know. And so we had to sit him down and have a conversation with him and then continue to reinforce the fact that you are black because you're beautiful. You are a human. The only difference between you and another person is your pigmentation. Your ability to learn is just as good as theirs. The fact that you're a different color has very little to do with your success in life. And it's up to you to make you do what, to follow your, 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 your point in life and become successful. And we kept reinforcing. That's, that, that has gone away from his, 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 his vocabulary now. He understands, and we, and we have to reinforce that. Because if we don't, who will? And I said, as she said earlier, the fact that being a black father, the major of the family, my job is I, we have four sons. And between the four sons and two daughters, we have like 17 kids, the grandkids, as Sonia said. And out of 17, 14 of those are males. We have conversation, just, we, we talk about football, we talk about everything else in the world, we talk politics, and then we get back to the thing we have to talk about, survival, you know. And some are in, 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 in biracial relationships, you know. And that's tough. Because people don't realize one thing, you can take a gallon of paint 
all white paint. And guess what? You put one drop of black in it, and guess what? It's not white no more. That's a fact. So when, when the, when the, when the, when the uh, black and the white get together, they have a child, that child, they call him biracial, that child is black. We don't believe it, look on the birth certificate. So they have, and I told I told, I told them, I said, listen, you guys got a rough road to hold. And the children are going to have a rough road to hold as well. But we're going to be there to back them 100%. Because we never let them forget the fact that, hey, you know, you have a history. It's not taught in the books that you go to school to listen to because you don't hear any black history taught in any of these schools at all. It's not there. They skate the issue. They spread it over. They don't tell you anything about black history at all. They don't tell you about the uh, things that, that this, this destroying the entire black neighborhood. They don't, tell you, they don't tell you those things. They don't tell you about the black inventors. They're smart, famous black people. You don't hear about that. You know, but it's just things that happen in the world today. And we're not here to, to, to make anyone feel guilty. We're just here for information only. And if you feel uncomfortable, like I said, you should, because we feel uncomfortable too. <laughs> Every day. You know? But uh, it's something we have to start talking about mm -hmm. and thinking about. And maybe when you leave here, it just be a thought in your head and you mention to other people, say, you know what, I never thought about that. That could be possible. People don't feel as comfortable because they're going through all different prejudices every day of their lives. You never know when the next one going to come and come and then speak to you. I don't want to golf course. And I don't, I don't golf. I golf before. I'm too young to golf. I, don't be, I golf when I'm 80 years old. That's when I'll start golfing. <laughs> Because we live with all the old people, at, you know, and they come there, they either die or move to a dog on a, a, a home and leave there, or go to, go, to, go, to, go to the grave. So I thought, I said, they said, how long do you golf? I go like, I'll golf when I'm 80. And I can be like the rest of the old people out there. Hit the ball and look for it for about 20 minutes, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, but, but that's my idea of living on a golf course. And the lady goes, he said, you live here? I go, yes, ma'am. How long have you been living here? I live 16 years. How long have you been living here? We just moved here. Oh, good. Okay. No, we've even had them ask, how'd you get up in here? Hey, sorry. I was here before you. How did you get up in here? <laughs> <laughs> it's ongoing. It's ongoing. You know, I mean, it, 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 it becomes right. like, what? You know, hey. Why even ask that, you yeah. know? But, you know, it, 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 and, and, and it's nice to find laughter and, and you discuss these issues because life itself, you have to find somehow to get past the divide. You have to know one thing. You have to find comedy and laughter in life because no matter how serious things are, guess what? You got to enjoy life while you can. It's not forever, so find a little joy in life no matter what the uh, tragedies in life have to offer. You have to find some means to be happy and to smile about certain things. You can't take everything serious, you know, because that's not how life should be. Life should be enjoyable, and God puts everybody here in this world for a reason, to be happy for the time you have. And we are all family. God made Adam and Eve. He didn't make a black Adam and Eve, but he made Adam and Eve. We're all descendants from them. So, and he doesn't make junk, so we're all good. <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's take some questions yes. now. But before we do that, can you express your appreciation with me for them? <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Um, I'm going to stand by you so that if uh, what you're saying can't be heard, maybe I can repeat it then.
I, uh, that's um, a good question. You know what? Oh. Can I just make sure, did you all hear the questions and statements? You couldn't back there. Can I briefly summarize? He was, first of all, thanking them, talking about his experience living in different countries where for a while he might have felt that he was the uh, uh, a minority or in a different person. but. He, uh, that it would be difficult living your whole life that way. He asked the question about poverty and the fact that African Americans um, struggle with that more than white Americans do. And so he's asking the question, what do they think about it? Go ahead. That's a good question you ask, and I'll tell you what, I think, like I say, uh, after this uh, thing happened in Minnesota, I think it, it was so, it was unreal. You know, I, I watched the stock market and I watched the things that happened on the, on the, the stock exchange in New York. And, and what I felt was it's like a reverberation of people saying, you know what, enough's enough. You saw more corporations said, you know what, we're not doing our part. Mm -hmm. We could give our black opportunity, opportunity to black people to do better than what we've done. Mm -hmm. They've given them a lot better chances. They have the issue of scholarship. They're making the jobs available for them. They're doing a lot more to, to, to bring them into the fold to say, you know what, we didn't do our part, we can do more. And corporate America is, step, is stepping up. They're stepping up right now saying, you know what, we have a part in this too. Because guess what? If they make money, what they do? They invest money, they make money. So you realize, hey, if we can get these people to have money, they invest in with us, we make money. So it's just a, it, it's a win-win for everybody. When, like you say, we get everybody out of, out of this poverty situation. Nobody wants to be poor. I don't think walk, you can't walk around and say, do you enjoy being poor? That's, 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 a, that's a mute question. They don't want to be poor. They got kids. They want to prepare for their kids. They want to provide for them. They, they want to have a decent housing uh, situation for them. They don't be profile when they, when they get in the car. Because most times they profile, and I'll be, I'll, I'll be honest with you, I worked at Christ and I used to get a new car every night. It's an overnight drive to see how the cars are different for the customers. And I have never gotten stopped. And I used to watch cars, and I'd be driving like everything. I mean, I'd be exceeding the speed limit, and I've seen cars that was older cars with black people in it, pull them over. It's profiling. You know, and these people, they should, I, a ticket meant, meant nothing to me, it was $100, but these people who can't afford to pay these tickets, they've been pulled over for that. And, 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 and that's, that's the, they're, they're trying to get away with this now and put people in jail because they can't pay fines to find other means of doing it, because most people are in jail right now are poor people, black people, who've gotten the fine for something, they can't pay the fine, so they put them in jail. Now what, now what sense does it make? The guy can't pay the fine, you put him in jail, how's he get the money to pay for it? It's the way the system works. But to your question, it's a great question, and I do feel that corporate America is stepping up right now to try to address some of the problems that's plaguing America by not giving people a chance to put their potentials to work to bring them up to, to the level they should be at. Nobody wants to get a check, there, but let me tell you something. I'm not going to go and reconcile everybody because there is, there is differences <coughs> in everything we do in life. Nobody's perfect. You're going to have people who are going to take what they can get, be they black or white, as long as you give it to them. But what you got to do, you got to put it out there and say, here, you, either you take it or you lose it, you know? Mm -hmm. So there's, there's got to be something where we have to make, the, make sure people have a, the availability of, 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 of reviving themselves. At the same time, though, we need to make sure when it's there, they take advantage of it. You know, I mean, giving out these stimulus checks and these people saying right now, everybody's saying right now, they're going to go back to work because they're making more money staying at home than they're working. Was that a good idea or a bad idea? Mm -hmm. Okay. Other questions? Yes.
I love cooking pie, so. <laughs> and I'm good at it, so. To briefly summarize, Sandy was telling about an experience in college when she went with a, a black, was it fellow student or another student to, into her home in a black neighborhood and how it was in many ways uncomfortable but also that you experienced a lot of love there. And you were also speaking about something that happened recently in a 12, 13 years ago in a neighborhood in St. Louis in which you were volunteering to clean up and uh, were taunted for that. Okay. Responses? Any thoughts? It was, you were blessed for that experience because you can kind of feel how other people feel, you know. Uh, you can get a taste of what we feel, <laughs> you know, sometimes. So it, it was a good experience for you. And if more people can experience in that, I think we'd have more love, you know, more fellowship with each other, appreciate everybody. And it's quite a time you go, you know, you look at that and um, no matter where we go, you said it right, that's the flip side of everything we do. Mm -hmm. And when, no matter how well your intentions are, they, may, they probably was misconstrued. And mm -hmm. That seeks to involve people who think that they're there for a different reason. They're ready just to be helpful, you know. And, and, and you know, somehow they read it in the wrong way, you know. Uh, in, in, in my lifetime, the clergy played a very important part in neighborhood. In the day when a pastor says something, everybody listened. I grew up in, 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 in the Baptist church, and whenever they spoke, people listened. They could, they could quell disturbances. As I've grown up, I've seen churches, in ch and I was in the church of the Catholic, it used to be left open. People could go in and they could, they could worship any time, day or night they wanted to. The churches now, uh, they're all locked up. They got cameras, they got security. You saw a white guy went into a Baptist church and, and killed, what, nine black people. Things have changed in our lives, you know. People misconstrue the goodness for badness. That's not right. And it's all based on race relations. Just look at the things that happen that goes on in our world today. It's there. You know. So we gotta talk about it. We can't just ignore it and say it's not there. It's it's a reality check for everybody. And even in church, we we are supposed to love God, know the Bible, He teaches love, and we hate. You know? It's 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 we have to get back to the Bible. <clears throat> get back to the love that God preaches and teaches. To that we can say amen. We are out of time now. We need to get ready for the worship service. I want to thank you both because last winter I sat in your family room and you shared some of these stories and your thoughts with me and it was such a wonderful, memorable experience and in a way we have now expanded the family and family room here in a sense, so we're having a discussion among family, brothers and sisters in Christ, and I thank you very much for that. Let's well,